Uh, everyone, um, to bookshop uh, uh, books by Euro. So this is a Melbourne Design Week uh, conversation um, with Liam Young, who's um, joining us from Los Angeles, uh, uh, focused on the book Planet City. Um, I'm joined by Liam and Stuart Geddes. Just Stuart designed the, um, the the book. But before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're gathered today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to um, their their, their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, and as we're live streaming today, of course, I would like to extend that uh, acknowledgement to um, all Indigenous people uh, across the lands uh, where people find themselves today and to acknowledge that all design and architecture uh, that takes place in Australia takes place on Indigenous land. Liam, um, it's lovely to see you um, all the way over there. Get your camera right. We've got good vision. And um, we'll just check that we can hear you okay. Okay, while we fit sort this out, I'm going to introduce um, Planet City, and um, we've got an excerpt of the film. So this is a... Um, uh, Liam works as a speculative architect, um, and his main medium is film um, and moving image. And uh, about two years ago, uh, the NGV uh, commissioned Liam to produce a film called Planet City, and this started uh, through a conversation with Liam really about um, how we could uh, produce a work that would draw attention to, the, um, to a, a potential scenario that responds to the climate crisis. So this um, film is uh, part of the NGV Triennial. For some of you may have seen it. It's on the ground floor at the Triennial at the moment. It's a 15 minute animated film produced by Liam and his team. Um, and we'll talk to the film in a minute, but uh, we've got an excerpt from Liam uh, uh, that just sort of sets the scene, so we'll play that. Thank you.
Okay. So let's get Liam back on screen and we'll begin our chat. Fine. Liam, I'd, uh, uh, welcome and um, it's lovely to have you here with us today. We've got a nice little crowd of people here at, 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 in the bookshop in Collingwood. Um, now here, we're here to talk about uh, Planet City, most importantly talk about the book. We've got Stuart Geddes here with us who designed the book. But what I'd like to do, we've shown the, the excerpt from the film which you sent over. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask you to introduce what you do because I, I, I briefly introduced you as a speculative architect but, but many people wouldn't know um, broadly what you do. What, what does that mean and um, what's, the, uh, what's the central sort of preoccupation of your practice at the moment? So, spoken of architect because I, I'm trained as an architect. I studied at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, but I don't, as an architect, design or make buildings as physical objects, but rather I tell stories about the global, urban and architectural implications of new technologies. So a lot of times in architecture, we, we do create imaginary and speculative worlds, but it's generally something we do in between making buildings or something that leads up to the making of buildings as objects. Maybe it's a, an unbuilt competition entry or it's something that the paper architects did in the 80s when they couldn't get a real commission because the economy was in the toilet. Um, but a speculative architect tells stories about architecture and cities as endpoints in and of themselves, um, where the fiction is the project. Um, the planet city is a fiction shaped like a city as opposed to a proposal for a, a city to be built and implemented if only I had the funding, capital and um, uh, political will to do so. Uh, so I guess our interest has always been in trying to develop and prototype um, what speculative technologies, emerging technologies, I should say, uh, how they're changing our lives. Um, and we treat film and performance, we, te we treat fiction as a kind of sight. In the same way that an architect might treat a vacant block of land as a sight, we treat the landscapes of a film, the thickness of a screen as a sight, and we make work proposals um, that exist in that terrain, on that territory. Can you hear me, Liam? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. When we started talking about Planet City as a project. Um, uh, it was after a performance that you gave at the Living Cities Forum um, in Melbourne. Um, you were talking about a hypothetical future significantly impacted by, by AI and surveillance at that time, um, journeying through this fairly dystopian city. And I remember having a conversation with you afterwards and saying, well, in, in, in theory, um, the systems that we need to radically change um, our approach to climate change exist. Um, and would you consider investigating the sort of the, the alternate future, a, a sort of a more utopian idea? And I'm not saying that Planet City has turned out to be completely utopian, but it is, it's, it's certainly turned out. And so you, you set off on a journey um, and came back with a proposal for that project. Um, can you just talk about the, the sort of the central proposition of Planet City as it, as it was at that very beginning point before you started then um, linking in to other people? Yeah, so I mean, our work has for a while been concerned with developing counter narratives around these technologies. And, and for the most part, something like the driverless car or AI or drone technology. Generally, 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 generally. Whoa, that was that was intense. Um, uh, I don't know if you hear that on my end, or I'm just just having these weird demons in my head that, that are hearing my voice echo endlessly <laughs> over and over again. I was going to plow on. Um, uh, technologies like driverless cars, uh, AI, drones, you know, these things we, we think of as being disruptive urban technologies in the smart city sphere are normally presented to us through, um, you know, images of uh, and, and discourse around better, right? They, they're going to give us um, uh, better cities, um, more sustainable cities. They're going to better connect us to our 
to our mother. Um, they're going to give us better orgasms. Um, they're going to make us better connected. We're all going to be better people because of these systems. And generally, technology makes it into our world because someone can monetize it. So they're selling us these things, the latest upgrade, the new iPhone, download this new app, um, uh, and so on. So for the most part, our work in the past has been trying to provide a counter narrative that, that sort of complicates these technologies. Yes, driverless cars are going to make commuting easier and we can activate that time that we normally spend behind the wheel. But at the same time, it fundamentally changes the nature of what a street is. Um, let's talk about that. Um, it fundamentally changes the nature of center and periphery. Let's talk about that. Um, the surveillance city that keeps it safe, that, that, that makes buses run on time and optimizes the energy and water grid at the same time um, uh, means that every inch of our world is endlessly scanned and, and mapped um, in real time over and over and over again. Where are the gaps and the cracks for people to go to a party, to take drugs, to have sex, to listen to music, the sort of things you might do in an abandoned illegal rave in a city that sees everything, those spaces uh, no longer exist. So we kind of tell those stories about the cultural and subcultural implications of, of these systems. Um, and generally, because of the dominant media narratives through which they make into make these technologies make it into our lives, um, that means we generally have been skewing towards the dystopian. Um, but uh, in the context of climate change, um, constantly being berated with 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 you know how our world is is on fire. Um, and especially in 2020, which is the, you know, really when we we're actually making the bulk of Planet City, we were living out a live action dystopian film, um, watching ap apocalypses unfold in front of us several times over. The counter narrative that seemed valuable to be putting into the world was actually an optimistic one. It was to say, well, what happened if, you know, we, we move beyond any kind of hope that nation states are going to act in a meaningful way about climate change. Um, and we we lean into global movements like the Global Climate March or the Women's March or the Global Climate um, Strike. You know, these are gatherings of human bodies that have at scales that have never existed before, uh, mobilized through a hashtag, through a social network page, um, instigated by the um, you know, the, the pervasive, um, seductive speeches of 15 year olds. Um, what would happen if we formed a global consensus that said, well, enough is enough. Let's try and do something. Let's let's live in a different way. Let's imagine cities differently. And Planet City, you know, a speculative city for the entire population of the Earth was born out of that sentiment. Um, and I think in the book I mentioned in my introduction, you know, that I, ref I refer to um, uh, the narrative when um, a group of authors all got together in Byron's Lake House in 1816, the, the year without summer, um, uh, just after the, the volcanic eruption in Indonesia kind of blocked out the sky and, and the rest of the world was, was cast into a global winter. And that's where um, Polidori, the, the Shelleys, you know, got together, bunkered down in this winter slash summer, and they invented what we know as modern horror. You know, that's where the Dracula mythology and stories were born. That's where Frankenstein first emerged. So in these moments of darkness, um, strange literary fiction and experiments start to emerge. And you know, if, if 1816 was the year without summer, then 2020 is in some way a year without end that we're all living, at least maybe not um, in Melbourne, you seem to be going about your lives quite normally, but, but here in LA, certainly um, we're still in March last year. Um, what would it mean to kind of make uh, to, to spend time during that year making a different kind of fiction, um, an optimistic fiction, so, you know, utopian and dystopian at the same time, but a different vision of what a climate future could be, that one that prototypes the necessary changes that we might have to go through um, in order to uh, maintain what we think of as human life on this planet. That was the sentiment, okay. sorry for the ramble. Liam, the, what's... what's Quite important, I suppose, in the context of talking about the book as well, is that the uh, the commission from the NGV was for a film. And then once we got in a certain point, um, what was quite interesting is that the way you approached this idea of building a fiction, you wanted to do that through some form of consensus, of reaching out to a lot of different people, because, of course, 
And, uh, you know, a, a, a counter proposition, say, for example, that's circulating at the moment is the sort of Bjarke Engels Master Planet project, which has been released as this kind of um, master plan for Earth, um, which is sort of an imposed system, a technological imposition, perhaps another sort of colonial construct. You were very conscious of, and we talked about this, the sort of the cultural, political, economic dynamics of this, as a, and, and it, it, for it to actually stand up as a proposition, it needs to be grounded in, in these things. So, um, and this this sort of leads us to the authors in the book, etc. But um, can you just talk through, like, who were the first people you you went out to to sort of start going? Okay, and, and because it's sort of an interesting mix of people. The 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 you've got you know, from, from fiction to reality, from pragmatics to kind of um, poetry. It's a very, very diverse group. But So where did you start and, and, and what was sort of motivating you on that, on that journey? And when did you feel like you had enough? Yeah, it's a, the way that we approach film or story is, is as spatial designers, right? Like I really think that architecture is, is just a craft of constructing stories in space. So when we make films, we're, we're not approaching it the way that a filmmaker or a scriptwriter might do. We approach it as a world builder. So Planet City is, yes, a film, but really it's a world that can be outputted in a whole lot of different mediums. World building is essentially medium agnostic. So the Planet City as a world um, is a film in the NGV triennial. It's a book. Um, it's potentially a documentary series, a comic book. Uh, a physical insulation, a set of costumes and masks. Um, so we were trying to think of it in those terms. So when setting about trying to design the worlds that we do, no matter how speculative or fictional they are, we begin in a deep engagement with the present moment. That our act of world building is actually an act of exaggeration or extrapolation. We look for the weak signals of possible futures that exist in the present, and then we expand them, we extend them, and, and push them into possible futures and essentially just play them out. So what we were trying to get into was this idea that you introduced in an earlier question, that in face with questions of climate change, the, the systems, the technologies, the renewable energy, um, the, the, the processes, the technological solutions involved in, in meeting the challenge of climate change, all these systems are actually already here. Um, the climate change is now a cultural and political problem. Um, and so we, the first person we, we speak to is then scientists and technologists, the people who are at the front line of climate change, who have developed all these systems and are essentially arguing for their implementation. Um, and for us, Planet City potentially acted as a form of outreach for them, you know, a form of science outreach where we could take their research, um, take the weak signals uh, that, they're, that they're involved in making and explore what would happen if they were fully funded and implemented at scale. Um, and for the most part, Planet City is a world building project as, a, as an urban design is literally just layering up all of these systems that are already here. So unlike most science fiction that you know, imagine a new technology um, that, that, that you know, just invent some new building material that's light as an air, or imagine a new tesseract energy source that's going to solve all the world's energy problems, everything in Planet City that makes the 10 billion city work um, is here today. Um, uh, scattered around the world in labs, in, in landscapes that we don't normally get to visit. Um, and the first part of the project was really just to collect all those voices of people doing this extraordinary work in this context. Um, but also, and, you, 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 um, you also, I mean, that, that, yeah, so there was this technical and, and, and pragmatic aspect, but also underneath that as, as well is a consciousness of um, the cultural implications of asking people to retreat, to leave traditional lands, to leave, you know, what we're, we're, we're sort of talking about in a way is, is at what point does the climate crisis become so severe that you might, that we might consider political, religious, cultural differences being um, 
l less important than actual survival. So there's this sort of there is there's, there's an underpinning there of something that's much much more about hu human culture and 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 indigenous knowledge systems as well. Yeah. So once I mean, once we laid that ground infrastructure of the city, our our next phase was bringing in a whole series of, of voices from different communities all over the planet, basically, um, uh, to start to think about the idea that you can't separate technology from culture. And all of our work, as I said, has been about exploring the cultural implications of technology. So what would it mean to prototype the new forms of culture and community and society that might emerge around these systems that we're now projecting and extrapolating forward? And, and really that's part of the response to, you know, projects like you mentioned, Vyaki and Engel's Master Planet, where when design, when the design community generally gets involved in a problem, they see it just as that, a problem. How can we solve this? Um, so, you know, the tradition of, of architects engaging with these kind of issues is the tradition of techno-solutionism. You know, what, what's at the core of Biaki's project is this planetary scale energy grid based on a technology that they've been exploring and developing. Um, and it's just one more imposition you know, to say that, hey, we've invented this new thing, this is going to solve all our problems. And at the same time, totally denying the, the, the socio-cultural, historical problems that led us to this condition in the first place. No, no technology is any kind of solution to that. Um, so any project that engages at this scale, it engages these prob pro problems at this scale, that only deals with them as technological problems to be solved, um, denies the potential of, of uh, you know, seeing where the real battle is, which is, which is in cultural change. Um, and that's what we tried to do. So the, the Planet City project is planetary in scale in that it brings together voices from all over the world. You know, we have um, folklorists from uh, all different countries. We have authors from, uh, from two authors from China, one a Caribbean Canadian author, one indigenous Aboriginal indigenous Australian author, um, one um, uh, American author, as well as um, theorists from uh, that, that are connected to Native American culture and so on. The idea is to bring into a science fiction project all of the voices that are typically excluded, um, especially in a town that I'm looking out my window now at LA and Hollywood. You know, for them, science fiction, both utopian and dystopian projects, are seen through a very particular narrative West um, and we were trying to open up what Planet City is a project and a world and a fiction to include the sorts of voices and challenges and narratives that are generally excluded from that context. And when we reached a sort of a midpoint within the project where the film was sort of in development, um, I mean, I should point out you, the film features costume design by Anne Crabtree. Um, you've got, a, you, you brought on a, a whole team of collaborators to help use photogrammetry to insert characters within the film. And the film follows this sort of procession through, through the different, um, uh, areas of Planet City. So, that, but when you watch the film, what's interesting is um, the the film's quite an abstract experience. It's a beautiful experience. The sound is very immersive, and the it's it's been a really well received part of the triennial. Um, and but the book becomes then much more essential to unpack because the the reality is that you all of this research that was done. Um, you know, there's a there's a sort of um, we talked about a sort of handbook or an instruction manual or something. Now the book hasn't manifest in terms of this. It's not it's not a, a sort of utilitarian guide to how to build Planet City, but it is um, in a way a guide to the different voices that would matter to to make this possible. The types of voices, the the diversity of voices. Um, so let's move to the book and talk about that more specifically. I mean, I'm conscious we've got Stuart Geddes here who designed the book. Um, 
um, it's an interesting little book. One of the, one of the things you mentioned scale, and the and the thing that's interesting for me in a way, it just in, in that idea of object making with with the book itself, is that the film is epic in scale, but the book is um, is really quite. Um, uh, you know, it's quite compact. It's this, it's, it's this chunky little thing. And you talk about science fiction in a way. Uh, I mean, my question probably to Stuart is that, you know, is this um, is this the is the approach to the book therefore um, putting this in some way um, within that the, uh, sort of the the, the 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 lineage of science fiction. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, I think it's very it's very much um, uh, it uh, the book picks up on a lot of these conversations that that um, uh, that you've been having already for for very obvious kind of reasons. Um, and I think one of the uh, one of the things that emerged pretty early as a as an idea was that rather than think about it as some kind of art or architecture book, thinking of it like using the same kinds of um, uh, economies and scales and systems that we would use to make a book like that, we could um, uh, compact, like crush that all together into a much smaller, much fatter, kind of chunky um, sci-fi sci paperback. Um, and I think by 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 doing that, like um, kind of poetically doing a number of the of the um, the things that Liam's already talked about, of like assembling all of these voices, putting them together, and and playing on a, on, a, on a line, I guess, between um, uh, making a, a series of kind of pragmatic decisions um, uh, with to do with the printing and 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 using that to create these kind of poetic outcomes, like the way the the um, the text is almost one book, like all, sorry, all of the text, all the voices are, are almost one book, and then all of these image sequences from um, that are that are from the world uh, they're just dropped in where they where they drop in and so you get this kind of this um, this lumpy kind of um, uh, ideas and spaces kind of bumping together um, to to create kind of interesting frictions and Liam um, when you started talking to Stuart um, you know I mean the the the, the Interesting thing. I mean, these the images that are a very important part of the project. I mean, it, can you just talk through in terms of the photography that you did and the characters that were created? Who are who are these characters um, within uh, within the film, within the book? Um, you know, uh, why are why, why are they there? Because it's 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 interesting how much the em emphasis of the film is on the human element. Um, when I think perhaps uh, from a when we were discussing it at an early stage and also looking at your earlier work, um, I think we had an assumption as an institution that it would be um, much more about the urban form and the kind of, um, you know, the, the, the built outcome, the technology. But you, you it, it's, so it's quite a big shift for you. Why was that... Um, why was that important? And in a way, it seemed that once you went in that direction, then you sort of went way further into that um, that that area. So it obviously really captured your um, imagination. Yeah, again, it's, it's trying to create a, a counterpoint to the other future visions of cities that, that exist out there in the world, right? Like generally, Hollywood loves a dystopian cyberpunk future because it, it, it lends itself to a traditional Western hero's journey, right? Um, there is always the hacker, the revolutionary, that can uprise against the mega corporation, the evil politician that's trying to you know, oppress whatever uh, city they're in charge of. And it makes for a good story. It makes for a lot of stuff that gets blown up and um, you know, a, a vehicle for Tom Cruise or Harrison Ford or whoever it is. Um, in trying to express a city that's that's more aspirational, what are the count? What are the other narratives that start to play out in that context? The reason why Hollywood hates the utopia is because it's really hard to tell a story in a place where everything's kind of okay. You know, um, where where's the conflict? Um, where's the big character arc that you can start to build? So, 
we we took on this idea of capturing the city in a moment of celebration or festival as our form of kind of human narrative. Um, so it wasn't about some sort of revolutionary uprising, but rather it was a moment of celebration, a moment of carnival. Um, one of the early kind of experiments we were doing in the city was uh, mapping all of the cultural festivals and holidays and, and celebrations that would occur all over the world on a, on a, on a calendar. Um, and you end up with this extraordinarily dense calendar where there isn't a single day without some kind of festival or celebration. What it means if you collapse all that together into one place, then you have this eternal party. Uh, so this idea of, a, of an endless festival cycling through the city on a 365 day loop became the, the form and the, the human narrative that we started to build the film around. And that lent itself to these extraordinary kind of carnival costumes, which were attempts to be expressions of the new forms of community that would start to emerge. In a, emerging in a city where the traditional identification that we might have with states and nations, these kind of arbitrary borders that we at one stage drew on a map, have all dissolved. And now neighborhoods start to form around shared cultural practices. Um, you start to have kind of characters that we see in the festival, like the drone shepherds, um, the high altitude bot herders, um, the, the, the urban beekeepers, uh, the algae farmers, and just kind of trying to give form to, to these new forms of community, but at the same time doing so in a way that's that's celebratory. Um, that's how the characters start to emerge. So running through the book and these landscapes, we wanted to be really clear that it wasn't just a design project, but you can't separate a city from its citizens. So we wanted to have this, this thread of, of these characters running through the book and intersecting and overlapping with the landscapes that they might occupy. Um, 